You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What does Sputnik have to do with student loans? How did a set of trembling hands end the Soviet Union? How did inflation kill moon bases? And how did a former president decide to run for a second non-consecutive term? These are among the topics we deal with on the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics podcast. We tell stories of history that relate to today's news events. Give a listen. My History Can Beat Up Your Politics wherever you get podcasts. Welcome to episode number 144 of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello, y'all. Thanks for tuning into the podcast. With last week's episode, we wrapped up our discussion of the Battle of Kernstown, which took place on March 23rd, 1862. We talked about how the fight at Kernstown had gone badly for Stonewall Jackson, and we talked about the mistakes he had made there, but we said that in the final analysis, he had hit the Federals hard and achieved his main objective of causing alarm in the Union High Command. So, although Kernstown was a tactical defeat for Stonewall Jackson, he had achieved a strategic victory since the battle had important repercussions with regard to the war's eastern theater, specifically with how it impacted McClellan's Peninsula Campaign. Remember that as part of Little Mac's grand plan for his big offensive for what turned into the Peninsula Campaign, Nathaniel Banks' force out in the Shenandoah Valley was slated to leave the valley virtually undefended as Banks shifted east of the Blue Ridge Mountains to cover the area around Manassas Junction, where his troops would be part of the covering force tasked with protecting Washington, while McClellan and the Army of the Potomac went off to capture Richmond. That was the plan anyway, but... But that was before Kernstown. Before Kernstown, McClellan had been certain that Stonewall Jackson's little rebel army in the valley didn't pose any threat. But after Kernstown, after Jackson's unexpectedly aggressive move in attacking Shields' division, Little Mac decided that the pesky Jackson would have to be dealt with sternly so that he would pose no more problems. On April 1st, McClellan told Banks, quote, The change of affairs in the Valley of the Shenandoah has rendered a corresponding departure, temporary at least, from the plan we had some days since agreed on. The most important thing at present is to throw Jackson back and then to assume such a position as to enable you to prevent his return. It will be probably important and advisable to move on Stanton, but this would require secure communications and a force of from twenty-five to 30,000 for active operations. It should also be nearly coincident with my own move on Richmond. End quote. In other words, what Little Mac was now contemplating amounted to a determined effort to drive Jackson from the valley. On paper, Banks' corps of over 20,000 men in two divisions seemed to be more than enough for this mission, provided that Stonewall wasn't substantially reinforced. Meanwhile, though, Abraham Lincoln and Secretary of War Edwin Stanton were discovering, to their dismay, that although McClellan had launched his peninsula campaign, he hadn't provided for the protection of Washington as he'd promised. Remember that Little Mac had included Banks' force in the number he claimed he'd left behind to cover the capital. But now, after Kernstown, Banks' troops were to stay out in the Shenandoah Valley to deal with Stonewall Jackson. As you guys already know, Lincoln and Stanton were far from pleased to discover that quite aside from leaving Banks in the valley, McClellan had done some uh, creative arithmetic in coming up with the number of troops he claimed were protecting Washington. This situation produced two reactions that would have a profound effect on Stonewall Jackson in the valley. Firstly, Lincoln ordered that Irvin McDowell's corps, which hadn't departed yet to join the rest of the Army of the Potomac on the peninsula, now wasn't going to the peninsula, 
Instead, McDowell's 37,000 men would stay in northern Virginia and cover the direct overland route between Washington and Richmond. As you guys know, Little Mac blew a gasket over this withholding of McDowell's corps and later blamed all of his woes on the peninsula on it. But he'd set himself up for the aggravation by deliberately undermanning the force he'd left behind to cover Washington. The president fired off a message to McClellan on April 9th, admonishing him for his failure to adequately safeguard the Capitol, as he'd promised to do. Lincoln said, quote, I do not forget that I was satisfied with your arrangements to leave banks at Manassas Junction, but when that arrangement was broken up and nothing was substituted for it, of course I was not satisfied. I was constrained to substitute something for it myself, end quote. The second part of Lincoln's reaction that had an effect on Jackson and the Valley had to do with a reshuffling of the federal command structure. Lincoln had previously decided to transfer the 10,000 men of Brigadier General Lewis Blanker's division from the Army of the Potomac to Major General John C. Fremont's newly created Mountain Department in Western Virginia. Now, the president also decided to not just withhold McDowell's troops from the Peninsula Campaign, but he redesignated McDowell's Corps as an independent command with instructions to advance south to Fredericksburg on the Rappahannock River to better cover that direct route between Washington and Richmond. Finally, Banks' force in the valley was withdrawn from McClellan's direct control, Banks' command was redesignated as the Department of the Shenandoah. As y'all may recall, Little Mac was furious at the loss of 45,000 or so troops from his plans for the Peninsula Campaign, and he declared that the success of the Union's cause was now imperiled. At this time, down on the Peninsula, McClellan was dithering in front of the rebels' Yorktown-Warwick River defensive line. In a letter to his wife, he said, quote, I have raised an awful row about McDowell's Corps and have, I think, rather scared the authorities that be. The president very coolly telegraphed me yesterday that he thought I had better break the enemy's lines at once. I was much tempted to reply that he had better come and do it himself. End quote. So, aside from Little Mac's histrionics, which are always amusing slash distressing, What we hope you take away from the discussion so far is the far-reaching consequences of the Battle of Kernstown. Banks' two divisions, rather than being withdrawn from the valley, are now going to stay in the Shenandoah to deal with the pesky Jackson. In addition, Banks' force is withdrawn from McClellan's direct control and becomes an independent command, the Department of the Shenandoah. And then, with regard to Blanker's division, which is being transferred from the Army of the Potomac out to Fremont in western Virginia, well, Banks is authorized to detain Blanker in the valley if he's needed to help deal with Stonewall. Then, due in part to the fact that Banks was now staying in the valley, McDowell's corps was held back from the Peninsula Campaign in order to protect Washington. And McDowell's force was also withdrawn from Little Mac's direct control, and designated an independent command, tasked with covering the direct overland route between Washington and Richmond. So, all of that changing of plans and reshuffling of commands brings us back full circle to what we said at the top of the show, that although Kernstown was a tactical defeat for Stonewall Jackson, he'd achieved a strategic victory since the battle had important repercussions with regard to the war's eastern theater, specifically with how it impacted McClellan's Peninsula Campaign. We wanted to hit the pause button here, so to speak, because what we just shared with y'all with regard to the consequences of the Battle of Kernstown is all essential information if you want to understand the larger narrative of Stonewall Jackson's Valley Campaign. But we think it's really just half of the story with regard to how it impacted McClellan's Peninsula Campaign. And we say that because we really don't think Jackson's activities in the Valley impacted the conduct of, or the outcome of, the Peninsula Campaign at all. 
And we say that because all other things being equal, McClellan was still going to be McClellan. In other words, say that Stonewall had sat on his hands and remained on the defensive in the valley, or even been withdrawn from the valley. And so Kernstown would have never happened, and Banks could have quit the Shenandoah and come east as planned to help cover Washington, even if that happened. And even if Lincoln and Stanton had been satisfied with the forces left to protect the capital, and even if Blanker's division wasn't transferred to Fremont, and even if McDowell's corps was sent to the peninsula as planned, in other words, even if Little Mac's plans hadn't been upset by events in the valley and by interference from Washington, we don't think it would have made one bit of difference to what happened on the peninsula, because McClellan was still going to be McClellan. We think the Peninsula Campaign was fatally wrecked by McClellan's month-long delay in front of Yorktown, and Little Mac's decision to besiege Yorktown had nothing to do with the absence of McDowell's Corps or with any other interference from Washington, but instead was due solely to McClellan's manifest unsuitability for field command. Well, it's always interesting to think about the what-ifs of history. In this case, what if McClellan's plans for Banks' withdrawal from the valley hadn't been upset by Kernstown, and what if McDowell's corps had gone to the peninsula as planned, and so on. And the speculation was especially interesting in this case, since it allowed us to use the phrase, McClellan's manifest unsuitability for field command. But now we should probably get back to what actually did happen. After their defeat at Kernstown, Jackson and his battered valley army spent the next few days slowly retreating to the vicinity of Mount Jackson, where the brief campaign had started. Stonewall pulled his weary men back to the area of Rude's Hill, a strong defensive position several miles south of Mount Jackson that was protected by a sharp bend in the north fork of the Shenandoah River. At Rude's Hill, Jackson took a small step that would pay big dividends in the near future. He summoned 33-year-old Jedediah Hotchkiss to his headquarters on March 27th. Hotchkiss was a transplanted New Yorker who had an intimate knowledge of the Shenandoah Valley's topography. After graduating from school in 1846, Hotchkiss taught for a year in the coal country of Pennsylvania. Then, while on a walking tour of Western Virginia during the summer of 1847, Hotchkiss was offered a position as a tutor in Mossy Creek, a small hamlet in the Shenandoah Valley County of Augusta. He accepted the job and within a few years had opened his own school, the first of two that Hotchkiss would run in Augusta County during the 1850s. From the moment he arrived in Augusta County until the outbreak of the Civil War, Hotchkiss used his free time to explore the valley while teaching himself cartography and surveying. He was also a devout Presbyterian who taught a popular young men's Bible class, and Hotchkiss married Sarah Ann Comfort, a woman from Pennsylvania, in 1853, and the couple had two daughters, Nellie and Anne. As the sectional crisis intensified in 1860 and 61, Hotchkiss was living quietly in Churchville, Virginia, with his young family, and running the very successful Lock Willow Academy. Although his brother was a staunch Unionist, Hotchkiss tried to avoid involvement in politics, until Virginia seceded. By that time, Hotchkiss had been living in Virginia for 14 years, and felt that his allegiance lay with his adopted state. Thus, in June 1861, he closed his school and joined the Confederate Army as a military topographer. Although Hotchkiss would become the Confederacy's best-known mapmaker, his lack of an engineering degree kept him out of the Confederate Engineering Corps, which was dominated by West Point graduates. Nevertheless, the Confederacy needed maps desperately, and Hotchkiss was put to work immediately. Despite being self-taught, it quickly became obvious that Hotchkiss was, was skilled at estimating distances and elevations, and his maps were praised for their clarity and elegant style. 
A bout of typhoid fever sent Hotchkiss home to convalesce in August 1861, however, and when he returned to the field, it was as an officer in the Augusta County Militia. Hotchkiss would become a member of Stonewall Jackson's staff, though, when he was summoned to Jackson's headquarters that day in March, four days after the defeat at Kernstown. According to James I. Robertson, Jr.'s biography of Stonewall, the general and Hotchkiss weren't total strangers, for they'd become acquainted in the 1850s, when Hotchkiss was a house guest of the Junkin family in Lexington, and Jackson was still living with his in-laws. Now, Jackson told Hotchkiss, I want you to make me a map of the valley, from Harper's Ferry to Lexington, showing all the points of offense and defense. Then, referring to his aide, Stonewall added, Mr. Pendleton will give you orders for whatever outfit you want. Good morning, sir. Such apparent gruffness from the preoccupied Jackson didn't bother Hotchkiss, for he was eager to serve under Stonewall, and he promptly began his work as map maker for a general who knew that a thorough understanding of the valley's topography would be the key to any future military success in the Shenandoah. And in this respect, Jedediah Hotchkiss would serve Jackson extremely well. Jackson spent two busy weeks at Roots Hill. The men rested as much as they could, but there was also drill and outpost duties supporting Turner Ashby's horsemen, and as for Jackson himself, he toiled from dawn to late night. Stonewall was given the gift of time to rest and reorganize his army due to the slow and cautious pursuit the Yankees mounted after Kernstown. As we mentioned in the last show, James Shields, despite his absence on the field during the battle at Kernstown, had not let that stop him from claiming credit for the victory. And to boost his image further, he had also embellished the Confederate numbers tremendously. Shields placed Jackson's force at a minimum of 11,000 men, at least three times the true total that Stonewall had actually taken into the battle. An alarmed Nathaniel Banks had returned to Winchester in the immediate aftermath of the battle and had accepted Shields' estimate of rebel numbers, and so Banks had followed Stonewall warily. In two days of pursuit, Banks' advance units got no farther than Tom's Brook, a mere four miles south of Strasburg. There they were brought up short by Turner Ashby's horsemen on the far side of the little stream, and there Banks remained for a full week, trying to figure out the terrain and complaining that the enemy, quote, pickets are very strong and vigilant, end quote. Finally, on April 2nd, Banks' Federals splashed across Tom's Brook and pushed south. After a 10-mile march, they arrived at Stony Creek by nightfall, only to find Ashby again on the other side. This position had been recommended to Jackson by Jedediah Hotchkiss, who had surveyed the area and found it a good spot for a delaying action. Stony Creek was wide, with steep banks, and swollen by spring rains, and Turner Ashby had burned the only bridge across the stream. Jackson and the main body of his army were a further ten miles or so to the south, at Roots Hill, but Banks paused at Stony Creek to worry, just as he'd done before at Tom's Brook. Several difficulties were confronting him. Ashby remained aggressive, Stony Creek posed a substantial problem, and the wretched early April weather, with heavy rains and slushy snowfalls, was hardly conducive to major military operations. And so, despite the overwhelming numerical superiority of his force, Nathaniel Banks was uncertain how to proceed, and he lingered north of Stony Creek for two weeks. Hey y'all, spooky season is here. And if you're looking for a show to whet your appetite for a little haunted history, then I'd like to invite you to check out Southern Gothic, a chart-topping history podcast that explores some of the most infamous legends, folklore, ghost stories, and hauntings of the American South. We've covered all sorts of stuff from the Bell Witch of Tennessee to the disappearance of the Confederate submarine, the H.L. Hunley, not to mention our deep dives into the local lore of some of America's oldest, 
and most haunted cities like New Orleans, Charleston, and St. Augustine. So if you're ready for a little good old-fashioned Halloween storytelling with a commitment to quality historical research, then be sure to check out Southern Gothic today. It's available now on all your favorite podcast apps. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation, Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast, wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. While Banks remained inactive, Stonewall occupied himself with administrative matters. Besides bringing Hotchkiss on board as the Valley Army's mapmaker, Jackson offered the post of headquarters chaplain to Robert L. Dabney, a prominent Presbyterian minister then on the faculty of Hamden Sydney College in Lexington. Dabney also happened to be the husband of Anna Jackson's cousin, and Anna thought him the most brilliant theologian alive after her father. Dabney had served briefly as chaplain of a Virginia regiment in 1861. Despite Dabney's inexperience, Jackson offered him the added inducement of a senior staff position should he wish to involve himself in military matters. Jackson's next personnel decision stunned the Valley Army. On April 1st, he relieved Richard Garnett from command of the Stonewall Brigade for, quote, neglect of duty, end quote, at Kernstown and placed him under arrest pending convocation of a court-martial. Though it's not precisely clear why, Jackson had never liked Garnett and had never been comfortable with Garnett leading his Stonewall Brigade. On March 28th, Jackson had requested that Joe Johnston send him a new brigadier general, but he consulted no one before acting against Garnett. Neither did he gather evidence to support the charge or its seven specifications. But as Peter Cousins points out in his book on the Valley Campaign, Evidence would have held no sway with Jackson in any case. He had made up his mind that Garnett's decision to quit the field before nightfall had robbed the Valley Army of a drawn battle at Kernstown. Cousins goes on to explain that shock, anger, and disbelief greeted the news of Garnett's arrest. Almost to a man, the Stonewall Brigade condemned Jackson for having deprived them of a popular and battle-tested commander. On April 2nd, Major Frank Jones of the 2nd Virginia wrote in his diary, quote, Heard this evening General Garnett has been suspended from command. It fell like a thunderbolt on our brigade, and officers hastened to Garnett's tent to express our astonishment and sorrow to lose so valuable and gallant an officer, end quote. Four days later, Jones was no closer to comprehending the matter. In a letter, Jones told his wife, quote, General Jackson has arrested General Garnett and deprived him of his command. We do not really know why, but General Garnett acted with great gallantry on the 23rd. Our brigade was astounded at the order, and had it not been that our cause was too sacred to jeopardize, there would have been considerable commotion amongst us. End quote. Jackson's new aide-de-camp, Henry Kyde Douglas, was unable to find a single officer in the Stonewall Brigade who believed Garnett had done wrong in retreating at Kernstown. Douglas stated, quote, It may be said that for once the officers and the men of General Jackson's old brigade almost unanimously disagreed with him. Their regret at the loss of General Garnett was so great, their anger at his removal so intense and universal, that their conduct amounted almost to insub- insubordination. End quote. Whereas before Jackson's rides past the brigade had been greeted with wild cheering, for several weeks after Garnett's arrest, 
Stonewall's appearance was greeted with only, quote, sullen and resentful silence, end quote. Garnett's replacement, 32-year-old Charles S. Winder, initially fared no better, either with the Stonewall Brigade or with Jackson. Jackson appeared constitutionally unable to trust his second-in-commands or to use them properly. As Henry Kai Douglas put it, Stonewall, quote, was not always in pleasant accord with officers next in rank and was apt to judge them harshly, end quote. Winder was a Maryland native, a West Pointer, who had at one time been one of the youngest captains in the pre-war regular army, although his career had been derailed by chronic poor health. Like Stonewall, Winder was a strict disciplinarian and a man of strong will, and was regarded as something of a martinet, but the regiment he led before reporting to the Valley, the 6th South Carolina, was acknowledged to be one of the best in the Confederate Army. Winder had expected and wished to receive a brigade in Longstreet's division, and he accepted the valley assignment only reluctantly. In Shenandoah, 1862, Stonewall Jackson's valley campaign, Peter Cousins tells of how, quote, a day or two before Winder joined the valley army, the field officers of the Stonewall Brigade met secretly and agreed to show their displeasure by not calling on their new commander. With one exception, they were true to their word. Major G. Douglas Mercer, the brigade quartermaster, broke with his companions and paid a visit to Winder for the express purpose of wagering his fellow Marylander that he would only last a few weeks in command before Jackson placed him under arrest for some cause or another. Cousins continues saying that, quote, The rank and file of the brigade, for their part, were loath to transfer loyalty from the likable Garnett to a haughty non-Virginian. Winder's aide-de-camp, Lieutenant McHenry Howard, got an early taste of the brigade's hostility and of Winder's uncompromising rigidity in the face of it. One day, when I was riding with General Winder past the encampment or bivouac of one of the regiments, there was some faint hissing. I was not certain that the general heard it, but as soon as he reached headquarters, he sent for the colonel and told him it indicated a bad state of discipline in his regiment, and if anything like it occurred again, he would hold the colonel responsible. End quote. Besides Winder, the Valley Army's April rebuilding and reorganizing saw other changes in brigade commanders. William Tolliver, the politically well-connected colonel who had been one of the loudest of Loring's subordinates to bitterly denounce Stonewall with regards to the Romney campaign, now returned to the valley as a brigadier general and with orders to assume command of the 3rd Brigade, the brigade that Fulkerson had been leading. Stonewall, not wanting Tolliver, protested vigorously, but it did no good, the War Department in Richmond insisted that Tolliver rejoin Jackson's army. But according to Robert G. Tanner in his book on the Valley Campaign, quote, Fortunately, Tolliver's attitude had improved, and he would demonstrate that the Romney spirit was gone. Jackson also sought a replacement for Colonel Burks, who had departed the 2nd Brigade on extended sick leave, but he got no action, and so left the brigade under its senior colonel, John Campbell of the 48th Virginia, end quote. During the Valley Army's time at Roods Hill, the Confederate Congress on April 8th rendered its thanks to Jackson and his command for their, quote, gallant and meritorious service in the successful engagement with the greatly superior force of enemy near Kernstown, end quote. Eight days later, the Congress enacted legislation that would have a profound impact on the Confederate war effort. Based on a recommendation that Jefferson Davis had submitted on March 28th, the rebel congressman passed the first conscription act in American history. It made all white men between the ages of 18 and 35 subject to three years of military service and obliged all those already in the Army on a 12-month enlistment to serve two years more. However, a drafted man could hire a substitute from among white men not liable to conscription. Anticipating congressional approval of Jefferson Davis's request, Virginia Governor John Letcher, on March 29th, ordered that all Virginia militia, then in service, be drafted into existing volunteer companies 
in order to bring Virginia regiments in the Confederate Army as close to full strength as possible. The overwhelming number of militiamen accepted their fate, but a large part of the Rockingham contingent opted for armed resistance to Letcher's proclamation. While on their way to join the Valley Army, 200 members of the unit deserted into the mountains near Swift Run Gap. Taking up a defensive position in the rugged terrain, the deserters declared their intent to fight the draft. Stonewall moved swiftly to crush the mutiny. He sent four companies of the 33rd Virginia, three companies of the 27th Virginia, some cavalry, and a section of artillery to knock the Rockingham militia out of their mountain hideout. One of the artillerymen who went out on the expedition said, quote, It required only a few shells to drive them from their position, bringing part of them to terms and frightening the other half to death, and causing them to scatter in every direction. End quote. Nearly all of the deserters were rounded up, and within a week they found themselves reluctant members of the Valley Army, many in the same companies of the 27th Virginia that had rousted them out of the mountains. Pro-Union sentiments had motivated a surprisingly large number of the Rockingham mutineers, but other Valley residents sought to evade the draft on religious grounds. Pacifism kept them from taking up arms in the war, and so Quakers, Dunkers, and Mennonites by the hundreds went into hiding or headed north. The draft itself, enlistments by those preferring to avoid the stigma of conscription, and the return of veterans from furloughs granted under the December 1861 Furlough and Bounty Act, doubled the strength of the Valley Army in April 1862 to just over 6,000 men. The new men and returning veterans found themselves in a miserable mud hole of a camp. The weather was unseasonably cold during the first half of April, and it rained or snowed constantly. As the open ground at Roots Hill was churned to muck, drilling was suspended, and except for those men supporting Ashby's line at Stony Creek, most everyone else huddled around campfires and complained about the cold and mud. The horrible weather had played a part in Nathaniel Banks calling a halt at Stony Creek. The heavy April rains meant that Banks' supply lines were in a poor state, and the men had been on reduced rations. Another reason for the Federal forces' inactivity was lack of shoes. The colonel of the 29th Pennsylvania told Banks that nearly his entire regiment was barefoot. The 13th Indiana and 5th Connecticut were in similar straits. Alpheus Williams was furious over the situation in his division. He stated that the shoddy shoes issued to his men in Winchester just after the Battle of Kernstown had worn out in less than two weeks. He said, quote, Such is the fraud that contractors are permitted to put upon poor soldiers. I can hardly conceive of a crime more fitly punished by death. We should be far in advance but for those constant drawbacks which fairly unfit an army for marching. End quote. Another cause for Banks holding back at Stony Creek was the absence of Blinker's division, which Banks had been counting on daily to reinforce him, but which had seemingly disappeared from the face of the earth after setting off from Warrenton on April 6th. After six days with no word from the all-German formation, an exasperated Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, ordered William Rosecrans, then in the capital awaiting assignment, to go out and find Blanker. Rosecrans located him on April 15th near Paris, Virginia, on the east bank of the rain-swollen Shenandoah River, just 25 miles from Warrenton. The Germans had been there for four days, trying to find a way across the river, after 40 men had drowned in their first unsuccessful attempt. Besides being stymied by the raging river, the hapless division was short of ammunition, shoes, tents, food, and wagons, and most of the men had been sleeping in the snow and mud without shelter. Upon receiving Rosecrans' report, Stanton apologized to Blanker for the government's neglect of his division, then ordered him to proceed directly to Fremont's Mountain Department. By the time Blanker and his men completed their odyssey and arrived in western Virginia, though, 
They were near starving and so thoroughly worn out that they were unfit for combat operations. Meanwhile, at Stony Creek, Nathaniel Banks, after 15 days of fretting over supplies and sundry other matters, at long last felt himself ready to test Jackson's strength. Banks' objective was the crossroads town of New Market, 15 miles beyond Stony Creek. Seizing New Market would allow the Federals to take Mount Jackson and drive the Confederates from their Rude's Hill stronghold, hopefully without a fight. And so on April 16th, Union cavalry rode up Stony Creek, forded it at a place where Ashby's horsemen had neglected to post pickets, and captured some 60 unsuspecting rebel troopers who were holed up in two buildings trying to escape the rain and cold. Before dawn the next day, Banks threw infantry across Stony Creek, and Federal cavalry pushing south captured the wooden bridge that spanned the north fork of the Shenandoah a mile south of Mount Jackson, even as Ashby's men unsuccessfully tried to fire the bridge. Turner Ashby was the last Confederate to leave the bridge and reach the covering fire of the rebel artillery on Roots Hill. Ashby had been riding his magnificent white war horse, Tom Telegraph, and as Ashby rode up to the spot where Henry Kyde Douglas and several other Confederate staff officers had been watching the action at the bridge, Tom Telegraph collapsed. Douglas described the scene, saying, quote, Having borne his master with unabated spirit until the danger was over, Ashby's splendid stallion sank to the ground, dappled with the foam of heat and suffering. His wound was mortal. The big-hearted cavalier bent over him, stroked his mane, stooped down and gazed affectionately into his eyes, and the excitement of the last hour was swallowed up in his sorrow for his dying companion. Thus the most splendid horseman I ever knew lost the most beautiful war horse I ever knew. After Turner Ashby stepped away, nearby troopers and soldiers surrounded the fallen animal, cutting away tufts of tail and mane as souvenirs. Stonewall Jackson watched from the forward slope of Rude's Hill as Banks deployed four brigades of blue-coated soldiers as if for a frontal assault, but also sent another two brigades, one from Shields' division and one from Williams, off on a flanking march. If the flanking march were successful, the two federal brigades would be positioned between Jackson's force and New Market. But Jackson quit Rude's Hill without a fight. He not only conceded that position, but also gave up Newmarket. After that, the Valley Army arrived at Harrisonburg on April 18th. The next day, it marched 20 miles to the east and camped that night near Conrad's store at the foot of Swift Run Gap, one of the passes through the Blue Ridge Mountains. While Jackson was hurrying the Valley Army toward Conrad's store, Nathaniel Banks occupied Newmarket. There he awakened to the significance of the road that led from the town across the Massanutten. On April 19th, he sent a strong detachment over the road to seize the Luray Valley bridges across the south fork of the Shenandoah River. That federal force easily routed a band of Ashby's drunken cavalrymen who had been sent to destroy the bridges, but who had partaken liberally of the local Applejack along the way. By now, however, Banks had completely lost track of Stonewall Jackson. He informed Edwin Stanton, I believe Jackson left this valley yesterday. Again, on April 22nd, he wired Washington that Jackson had abandoned the Valley of Virginia permanently. Even though he believed this, Banks moved up the Valley Turnpike at a cautious pace, covering only 35 miles in 10 days. Not until April 26th was his main body assembled in Harrisonburg. On April 30th, Banks announced triumphantly that, quote, there is nothing more to be done by us in the valley, end quote. And in this wrong-headed belief, he now requested that he and his two divisions be transferred east of the Blue Ridge to join with either McDowell or McClellan for the march on Richmond. Banks told Stanton, quote, I pray your favorable consideration. Such an order will electrify our force. But Banks got considerably less than he hoped for. Stanton, after consulting with Abraham Lincoln, ordered on May 1st that Shields' division should march to unite with McDowell at Fredericksburg. Upon the arrival of those men from the valley, 
McDowell would move south to combine with McClellan's Peninsula Army for a drive on the rebel capital. Banks himself was instructed to stay in the Shenandoah with Alpheus Williams' division. Even though Lincoln and Stanton had at least partly accepted Banks' assurances of Stonewall's departure from the valley, others remained doubtful. Colonel Gordon of the 2nd Massachusetts couldn't help but wonder, quote, what had become of Jackson? That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation. And our recommendation this time is Shenandoah, 1862, Stonewall Jackson's Valley Campaign by Peter Cousins. Peter Cousins has mostly written about battles and campaigns in the Western theater of the Civil War, establishing himself as one of the most readable authors out there. But here he covers the Valley Campaign in the Eastern theater, and he covers it in the same fine narrative style. Uh, in-depth book-like studies that look at the entirety of Stonewall Jackson's most famous campaign are actually kind of few and far between. But of those that are out there, Cousin's book is a nice counterpoint to a future podcast recommendation, Robert Tanner's Stonewall in the Valley. Uh, in that while Tanner's book focuses heavily on the Confederate point of view, Cousin's Shenandoah 1862 gives good coverage to the Union side of the proceedings as well. You can find Shenandoah 1862, Stonewall Jackson's Valley Campaign by Peter Cousins and all of our book recommendations if you head over to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. And then we have a couple of new recruits to thank for their enlistment in the Strawfoot Brigade this past week. Greg and Stephen. Thanks, gentlemen. Some of you asked uh, what happened to Tracy at the very end of last week's show when she seemed to disappear rather suddenly. Well, as some of you longtime listeners may recall, this is the time of year when Tracy's ability to record the podcast becomes a bit doubtful from week to week as she struggles with a continual series of lingering colds and or sore throats that she picks up from kids at school. And last week, at the very end of our recording, uh, her voice just flat gave out. That's also why we're holding off on the next members episode, since we were just hoping her voice would last through this show today. Or at least I was. Uh, she'd probably appreciate a weekend off, but I just hate recording shows by myself. Okay, so anyway, thanks for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861-1865, to 1865, a history podcast. Tracy and I do hope you join us again next week as we continue with the lead-up to the Battle of McDowell, but until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.